All right, here, here's a category that I called Poets, Seers, and Heroes. And I got these words from the books, some of the books that are included. Um, but this category includes what people call literary criticism, you know, and, and then some people don't like that word because it's not like you're saying what's bad about the literature. Um, but this is where your impressions of Robert E. Howard and other books would be found. Uh, this category also has your adaptations of the ancients, and I have put in here, um, yeah, there's impressions of Moby Dick in here, and then there, I think there's three books of essays. Uh, so let's go down these, let's go down these titles. Shoot. Shoot. Okay. Well, the most recent one is By the Wine Dark Sea, and we have spoken about this one because I actually, this isn't a new book, but this is a book that I went through and um, reissued as a crackpot book. So, By the Wine Dark Sea, it's subtitled A Source Book for Adventures Set in Hellas, 650 BC. And um, this book is all about what life was like, and it's meant to be help someone who's a writer or a game designer who's writing something about set in, in Hellas, but it's got, what I like is the weapons. I don't know why. I've never did before I started doing this podcast, but now I'm interested in weapons, and you have this whole chapter describing the different kinds of swords and shields that these guys would carry. But there's other stuff, too, about uh, religious observances and calendars and clothing. What else can you tell me about this one? It was something that came about when I was on my flip phone walking down to uh, Fort Apache, the ghetto grocery store where my girlfriend Megan worked to pick her up from work. And I was talking to L.A. novelist and screenwriter V.J. Wax, and she was asking me for advice on how to do a realistic novel on Amazons. What you know, she was interested in the real history of Amazons and ancient Hellas, and uh, I volunteered to source it for her because it really touched on my ancient boxing work. But as she got more excited with it, she wanted to keep it secret because she was afraid her story would be stolen. So uh, I ended up saying, I'm sorry, I'm going to continue to write this and publish this. And uh, sorry, it's going to ruin your chances for a sale. But uh, there you go. So it really started out as me using the research I had done on ancient uh, Greco-Roman boxing to help a female novelist and screenwriter uh, write a reasonably realistic treatment of the Amazon subject. I don't know if she ever ended up using it or not. And uh, nowadays, I think it would be helpful to anyone who's trying to read the Greek works that have come down to us and you want to have like context for what life was like for these guys. It will add color and dimension to your reading, I think, if you're reading some of that old stuff. And it's fun. I like the the descriptions of the weapons. Okay. Well, next here I have A Well of Heroes 1 and 2. Are These, these books are still in print and for sale, right? Yes, uh, th these are my impressions of Robert E. Howard's work. I'm trying to read and review everything that Robert E. Howard has ever written, including fragments, poems, anything I can find. I, th I like the poetry. I really like when you uh, review from, I think it's a book called The Outer Dark. A Voice from the Outer Dark. I like those, and um, I have never read Howard until uh, I found you, and at the same time I found Greg Cochran. A Word from the Outer Dark. Was a the Word name from of, the Outer Dark. 
the Robert E. Howard Book of Poetry. And this was gotten for me by Mescaline Franklin when he traveled to Texas and visited the Robert E. Howard Museum. And he bought a copy of this book to support the museum and gifted it to me. Yeah, I don't. I think it's hard to find. I don't think you can get that book very easily. So that's pretty cool. And I just want to say here also that my favorite Robert E. Howard character is Steve Costigan. He's a boxing sailor, and I don't think you cover him at all until later. That that hasn't been published yet. Right. That'll that stuff would be like in uh, the Well of Heroes three. And uh, the other title is Of Fear and Night. So I've written four books. Uh, I've actually written five books that are impressions of Robert E. Howard's work. Dark Art of an Aryan Mystic. I withdraw. I withdrew from publication because I got some a lot of criticism on not. Ex- he called a woman his aunt, even though she wasn't his biological aunt. So I got a lot of. I got a lot of uh, grief over that. What? Yeah, yeah. There was a, he called her aunt somebody, but it wasn't really his aunt. She was the she was the lady that did the laundry for the family, and he, he called her aunt. And you know, so I basically repeated what he had called her without explaining in the text that eh, it wasn't really his biological aunt and blah, blah, blah. And I got a hard time from a Robert E. Howard aficionado about that. And also about the fact that uh, I didn't properly treat his letters to his friends with the uh, right amount of gravity. So I immediately knew I wasn't going to be able to write any Robert E. Howard book of impressions of Robert E. Howard that Robert E. Howard fanatics would feel comfortable with because they're all experts on the guy. And I was just interested in his work, not his, you know, idiosyncrasies or who his friends were or anything like that. I was just interested in the work. So I withdrew Dark Art of an Aryan Mystic from publication. There's about 17 copies out there somewhere. And I included a lot of that material in a well of heroes one some of it in a well of heroes two then i wrote a well of heroes three and i also wrote of fear and night which is another book about his writing okay so we we recently talked about this a little bit as well in the context of under an iron crown which is a fiction work of yours but it's so weird, and we've talked about this in other contexts, too, how attached people get to certain aspects of things, like, um, well, I mean, we don't have to talk about Harry Potter, but people just are s- super attached to that, and and to uh, Lord of the Rings, where it's like this fictional world is more important um and, and now it seems like that Howard fans have done that with his actual life, which is certainly important. But I remember I actually emailed um, some Robert E. Howard authority and to see if they would be interested in one of your books, and he sent me back a really rude reply <laughs> that I never responded to. But there, you, ha- you get these weird cults where people just get stuck and anything that kind of there's an annual award for Robert E. Howard literature, literature about Robert E. Howard. There's an annual award. I was actually put up for that award. And then uh, one of the people I think that recommended me for it found out that I made a bibliographical error in referring to the, what Robert E. Howard referred to as his aunt, which of course wasn't his aunt. It was just a mixed race woman that washed the family laundry or cooked their meals or, you know, one or the other, it was two different chicks. And, you know, I got a really scathing email from this guy and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm just withdrawing the the book from publication. And then he got upset that I withdrew the book from publication. 
when it was under consideration for some kind of award. I was like, you know, I just don't. I, I wanted to do as a writer who writes in the same area as Robert E. Howard. I just wanted to do my impressions of the man's work without having to be held to the standard of being a nerd about the the various aspects of his life. As a writer, I would much rather be people interested. I would much rather have people interested in my work rather than, you know, how a relationship of mine played out or how my schooling played out or what I did for a living. You know, I would encourage a myth, a mythos or a mythology or a, legendary status you know i would encourage people to make things up about you make rumors up and i I think that would be more effective more effective um marketing and more effective in the spirit of a fiction writer and um someone who as robert e howard did created these really lasting characters that so many other people have you know made their fortunes on you know it's it's just weird so well that series a well of heroes and that book the dark art dark art of an Aryan mystic that grew out of two volumes titled a thousand years in his soul one of them is subtitled Poets. The other one is subtitled Sears, in which I looked at the work of Robert E. Howard, Jack London, H.P. Lovecraft, another weird tale fiction writer. His name's eluding me right now. Oswald Spangler and uh, I think possibly Julius Evola. Under Poets, you have Jack London, Edgar Rice Burroughs. H.P. Lovecraft, Robert E. Howard, and Robinson Jeffers. And then under Sears, you have Lothrop Stoddard, Oswald Spengler, Ernst Junger, and Julius Evola. So that's really where the Well of Heroes series came out of. The one character, the one writer I stuck with was Howard. Uh, because he influenced me the most from the earliest stage. So there's two more titles that are in there because I do have a thousand years in his soul the poets both are also titled part one a thousand years in his soul the poets part one a thousand years in his soul the seers part one so were there maybe there are going to be more of uh, volumes I was I was going to review everything that all of these guys had written oh, wow. <laughs> at, at first you know that was uh, oh, it's wild but yeah that was my intention and then the real interest ended up being with Robert E. Howard. My attention to Robert E. Howard was really the only thing that grabbed people's interest as far as the emails that I got. And I figured, well, okay, I'll stick with that. I will focus on that. So I started the, I did the dark art of the Marian, Aryan mystic. Then I got that criticism. And I said, okay, I'm just going to look at everything he wrote. And that's when I started the Well of Heroes series, which will be an attempt to consider everything that he wrote that is extant, including fragments of poetry and prose, some of which are not even titled. The next title I have is The Pale Usher. Oh, OK. That is about the first 137 pages of Moby Dick. When I started looking at movie Moby Dick, the Pale Usher that ti- uh, that title comes from I think it is the second chapter in Moby Dick, and in Moby Dick the first 137 pages is an extended prologue. It's about breaking away from civilized society as a man and going off on your own, and it's clearly separate from the rest of the text of the adventure punning for the great white whale once they get out to sea. And I think I spent three years 
just going over that 137 pages, uh, forget how many chats. And it's, uh, it's Herman Melville's uh, greatest work. I've looked at other stuff that Melville has written and really pleased with the way that worked out. And I ended up after some people had requested that I do the rest of Moby Dick impressions. I started uh, the book under a troubled master eye, which is my impressions in the main body of the book Moby Dick. Uh, I hope people enjoy the pale usher because I don't know if I will ever finish under a troubled master eye. <laughs> Next, we have three books entitled Into the Mountains of Madness, part one, part two, and part three. It's a about 200 book reviews I did in the first four years that the site was open and other commentary and essays. When my webmaster saw that I wrote some book reviews, he said, make sure you put the title of the author and the title of the book in the subtitle. And when people search for a review of that, it will show up. And since you read and review weird shit, maybe other people who are interested in weird shit will find you. And sure enough, uh, of our like 4,000 regular readers, it seems like almost a thousand of these people came via book review searches. So I've now posted about 900 book reviews in from 2011 till 2020. So I'm going to do a little mom interjection here. And um, you had written about this practice of yours where you had like notes about every book that you read and that even before you had this website but it's just staggering how many books you've read and that you can remember something about them and that you have uh, your own uh, collection of reviews. So that's something I'm going to make my kids do. My older girl isn't there yet. She's not really reading chapter books yet, but I'm going to make her do that. Put just like the date, the title, the author, and just a sentence or two for her for now Louis L'Amour did that he uh, in his book Education of a Wandering Man he takes excerpts from his diary which was his bibliography he wrote down a title of every book that he read and apparently had an impressive library at his death I always wonder do I have an impressive library but I currently own no books so uh, I'm traveling around the country with about eight of them because, you know, I'm uh, basically a bum now and I had to give my books away. So I don't even have copies of my own books. That was really cool. It always warmed my heart that Willie Lamore had a library that was stocked on bookshelves that he designed in a room in his house. In that same category, I think we have The Breeder's Digest, which is probably my worst book. Okay, it's a collection of, uh, yeah, you know, don't buy it. Okay, it's just a collection of articles on dehumanization. It's very thin. It's like, you know, maybe 100 pages or something like that. And I think we put, my son and I put guinea pigs on the cover of it. It was pretty cool. Anyhow, and also in that is uh, one of my best earlier books, which is called Take Me to Your Breeder which was uh, subtitled Letters from an Extraterrestrial Anthropologist. Well, I don't have that one in here, but I should probably add it. <laughs> I don't know where I put Take Me to Your Breeder. It might be in Harm City, but I'll add it to this, to this list. There's a few others here. Well, tell me about Take Me to Your Breeder, 40,000 Years from Home. Or 40,000, what is that? What's the subtitle? 40,000 Years from Home is a subtitle to, no, 40,000 Years from Home is a title to a book on violence in which I delineate every single violent encounter I can remember that I was in. Take Me to Your Breeder is subtitled Letters from an Extraterrestrial Anthropologist. 
I was getting questions from readers around 2012. I answered one in the form of a letter from an extraterrestrial anthropologist because I was kind of embarrassed to take credit for my actual opinion. And the guy that asked the question was a guy I used to coach that had moved to another state. And he said, you know what? You finally make sense to me. You only make sense to me as an extraterrestrial anthropologist. He said that, that you know, uh, believing that you were anything other than an extraterrestrial anthropologist would really be upsetting for me. So uh, I choose to believe that you are an extraterrestrial anthropologist. And I decided to write like 17 more articles as Regal M116S. Okay, the extraterrestrial anthropologist who finished last in his class. <laughs> All right, well, I'll move that title into that bookstore. You also have here Saving the World Sucks. Which was rewritten and reissued as Writing Unchained. Both of the books are out there. Saving the World Sucks is, you know, not proofread. And, yeah. <laughs> but this so is a the book other one's about better. I, then I think this is a book about how it is that you can write two million books in your lifetime. And the short answer is that there you're not if you're not James LaFond you're not gonna do it, so just forget about it. Oh, well, okay, thank you. <laughs> but the, the idea I got for Saving the World Sucks actually came from writing my one book that was a game, Triumph. You know, the idea of every adventure is supposed to be the adventurers who are saving the world. That just sucks. That's ridiculous. Uh, come on. In, in what world is like the average Joe, is he able to save it? Well, the world must not be worth that much. Uh, so, you know, but both of those books kind of came out of that same rejection of the, the idea of the modern hero where it's somebody that saves the world you know for the worldies i guess so, I don't know. yeah it's the it fits in with the superhero idea and i think we talked about with um when we talked to adam smith and i said something like about how every american kid has to want to be the president you can't just be a normal person you know yeah. So have to go all out somehow. Well, uh, the other two books, well, two, there's three more. Two books in here are related. Um, one is Our Captain, and the other one is called A Sickness of the Heart. They're actually should have said them in the op opposite order. A Sickness of the Heart comes first, and then Our Captain. Um, those are about two uh, entradas, invasions into Mexico that preceded uh, the invasion that ended up being hijacked by Hernan Cortez and his little hottie slut Malinche interpreter uh, that took down the, the Aztec Empire, I was going to do a six-part series that was going to cover the these two first two expeditions and Cortez's invasion. But the only translation in English I was able to get a hold of by the admission of the translator omitted all the information on the military preparation. So I just had to stop it after uh, the first two entradas because this guy cut out like 40 pages of information on how they prepared for the military expedition, and it was all about the military expedition. And so I stopped the project. And so it's just those two short little things. This will probably never happen, but part of me wants to take a crack at, uh, you know, translating something like that. But I really have no qualifications to do that. But, hey, that doesn't stop me from doing other stuff. Well, I would just... Hey, I was dating a Spanish teacher in hopes of getting a translation out of her. Okay, but you know, so always I was only able to maintain that for a couple of years, so it didn't end up happening. But I did my heroic best. <laughs> okay, 
Well, the last title I have here is is one that I was reading. I remember reading this as it came up on your site, which is He, Gilgamesh into the Face of Time. So this is your adaptation of the ancient story. I feel pretty good about the work I did on it. Of course, it's not proofread, but I, I feel good about the adaptation and the footnotes that I did on that. And that work pretty much formed the basis of six projects I'm working on right now, adapting ancient epic poetry uh, into a form that postmodern guys might be able to appreciate. So there you have it. That's the store called Poets, Seers, and Heroes. 